Thank you very much. How's everybody? Hello. All right. All right, all right, all right. Thank you, thank you. I'm Mr. Balzer. I'm your teacher tonight. And the title of our lesson is There's Never Been a Better Time to Be a Teacher. All right? That's not funny. Don't laugh, please. All right? Listen up. I need everybody to take out their reading from last night, please. Take it out. Yes, thank you. Can you please take it out? Look at that. Awesome. Where's yours? Is yours uh, you don't have it? You forgot it? You weren't here? You were absent? Well, that's all right. Okay, I got it up here. All right. Now, this is what you were supposed to read last night. The title is, What LinkedIn Taught Me About Being Just a Teacher. I wrote this uh, last year, and it's a story. It's my story. It's also the story of tons of teachers that I know. Actually, they helped me write it. And so, it's also the story of a teacher in transition. You see, I taught for 10 years. I was an administrator for five years. I was in urban schools for 15 years. I loved it, almost every minute of it. But you know what happens is, just like everybody else in any profession, you want to kind of move on. You want to do some different things. But in my case, I didn't want to leave education, not even close. I love it. I wanted to kind of move into different parts of education because there's so many great jobs. There's so many great ways to apply what you do as an educator in different ways. And so that's what I wanted to do. And uh, you know what? This article is also a microcosm. It's a microcosm of what teachers go through and how they're perceived. And sometimes, irrationally, how they're perceived as inferior and how we see things differently when it comes to educators. This is a story about educators. And you know what? When I think about this, and when I think about this experience, I also think it's a lesson. It's a lesson that I think we can solve. It's a lesson that I think we can, we can do something with. You see, teachers, we know that they don't want to, we know that the youth of this country right now, they don't want to be teachers. We see that colleges of education, 10% less, less students want to be in the College of Education. They want to be education majors. We see this decline across the country, but in some states it's even worse. If you look at Texas, California, New York, you look at the most diverse states, you actually see that they're losing tens of thousands of teachers every single year. If you look at some colleges of education, they're actually going away. In many cases, the colleges of education are either being folded or they're being put into other colleges of education. In other cases, you see bachelor's degrees that are going away. And this is having an effect on the diversity of teachers. It should be no surprise that we only see 20% of teachers of color in the classroom. And if you think this doesn't matter, you better think again. Studies after studies have shown that a teacher that comes from the community of those students and a teacher that looks like those students can have the greatest impact on their lives. But see, here's the funny part. I don't understand this. I don't understand why people wouldn't want to be teachers. I loved being a teacher. I'm a teacher, will always be a teacher. But here's the really weird part. The last four years I've been doing research, I was at Boston University, and when I was doing this research, I saw the immense growth of this education market. And you're going to be surprised when you see some of these numbers. You see, teaching has amazing potential. Once you learn how to be a master teacher, you can apply these skills to school design, athletics, gaming, business. There are thousands and thousands of jobs, millions actually. In fact, in the last 20 years, 185,000 organizations that didn't even exist 20 years ago are now doing business in education. This is because of the rise of the philanthropy sector and giving. We have $41 billion a year that goes to education. That's $41 billion. That's more than any other sector, more than any other sector. Religion is the only other thing that people give to more than education. In the last 20 years, this kind of money flowing into education has created innovation. It's created new jobs. If you look at venture capital, $1.4 billion last year came into the education sector. You go back five or 10 years ago, that was maybe like 10, 15 million dollars. We've seen 1,000% increases in education. So I just couldn't understand, with all this money and with all, this, all these new companies, when I say 185,000, I say organizations, not, not even jobs. And this isn't future jobs, these are current jobs in the education sector. 
So who wouldn't want to be a teacher? I just don't understand this. I really don't. But you see, there's something else about this. As I wrote this article and I thought about this, I thought this is about the perception of the field. This is about the perception of teaching. And this is something that we can change. You see, I started looking a little bit more carefully and I was talking to my friends and I was looking at these job descriptions, including the job descriptions in those jobs that are in the K-12 space. So let's say a school design company or a company in ed tech. I started looking at those uh, job descriptions and I was like, man, that, wow, that looks like an incredible job. And it would say something like the ability to lead teams. We're looking for an MBA. We're looking for someone in the business community that can lead teams. And I thought, man, I know how to lead teams. This is me in New York City. This is me and probably millions of other teachers. Is that leading a team? All right, sometimes my team look like that. I'm not going to lie. All right, definitely. But what about working under pressure? Is that working under pressure? Take a good look at that face right there. All right, take a good look. All right, I'm under pressure. I got that covered. All right, these are my kids in New York City. Man, that's leading a team. And if it's not, I, I wonder why, what is, you know? But then I looked at other job descriptions. The job descriptions would say, you know, the ability to reach diverse audiences. We always see this one, you know? Is this reaching diverse audiences? 30 different countries? All these different languages? Teaching them the Constitution? Is this reaching diverse audiences? I think so. But yet, I don't know. What about this one? Creative out of the box thinker. You always hear that one in job descriptions. And in this one, I got to tell you, you know, we're, we're learning American history to a little John Cougar, little pink houses. I think that's pretty creative out of the box. But you see, here's the thing that I found out, and this is what happened when I talked to my friends and we all, teachers, veteran teachers, it's not that we want to leave the classroom. We love the classroom, we love it. But like everybody else, you know, you just want to mix it up. You want to, but you also want to be appreciated. You also want to be someone that is in a field that is cherished and appreciated, just like all others. You want to be in demand. And frankly, if you want to raise teacher salaries, you don't just arbitrarily set a teacher salary, which is what we do. You increase demand. That's supply and demand 101. That's economics 101. But see, here's what happened. I started looking at this and I started thinking, you know, what is in demand? These are the words that define teachers. These are the words that define the education profession. These are proud words. These are the words that define an immense skill set. As an educator, this is what defines me. It's what defines my friends, my colleagues, teachers in this room. Classrooms, lessons, students, teaching, units, counseling, curriculum. We should be looking for people that can do unit planning. That should be in a job description for a Fortune 500 company. Because if you can unit plan, you could take a textbook like this and synthesize it down so that a 14-year-old can read it, understand it, and they didn't even speak the language. Why aren't we looking for people that can unit plan or lesson plan, deliver lessons? These are skills and skill sets that we should value in any profession. You see, you make these in demand, people are going to want teachers. You want teachers, you're going to increase the pay naturally. But you see, these aren't the words that are in demand. It's these words. And I found myself in an existential crisis. I found myself as a teacher and an educator and a passionate one thinking about whether or not I should change the words in my own LinkedIn profile to reflect these words. And I did. I changed them, a lot of them. I found myself tweaking. How many of you tweaked your LinkedIn profiles in the last week? All right? You tweak it a little bit, you change a few things, and for educators, we don't even have LinkedIn profiles. And I asked my friends about that. I was like, why don't you have a LinkedIn profile? They're like, why? And it's not that they don't want to maybe experiment out there and see what jobs are there, they just feel like they're not respected. Their answer is, I'm just a teacher. All right? I don't understand that. And so I'd think about this, but then I saw something even more profound. I started seeing that terms were being replaced. Superintendent with CEO, or school counselor as an engagement coordinator, or principal as a director. And I thought, OK, some of this is wordplay. Some of this is business, business tactics. I, it's fine. I get that. But then I thought, you know, if we get rid of these terms, and the education profession is proud. It's 100 years old. It has its own philosophers and theorists like John Dewey and Maria Montessori. These are great theoreticians. These are great scholars and thought leaders, no different than Stephen Hawking. 
we get away from these terms, how are we going to wonder at the end then how you have that? There is no education profession if we're eradicating the identity of the profession, and that's what I wrote about. So here's the thing. We could do something about it. I'm going to give you a quick quiz, all right? It's a pop quiz, so you don't have to worry. It's true, false. It's a quick one, all right? True, false. This is what most students see as the career path to education. You go in as a teacher. It certainly was the latter when I went in. You go in as a teacher. You become an administrator somewhere along the line. I did five years. Loved it, by the way. But it's a 30-year track, and pretty much somewhere in there, there might be some middle management, coaching job here or there, all right? True or false, this is what most people think of as the career path, all right? Think about that. True or false, 30 years is a long ass time. <laughs> it's a very long time, all right? Now, if you're a kid who's 17 years old thinking about what you're going to major in, you just did 17 years in a school. Now, I'm going to jump in. I'm going to do, that's 47 years. But now, you've got to do it in college, too. And then, you know, so that's like 51 years in school, all right? That's not a very compelling proposition. In fact, the numbers show that. 50% of teachers bail in the first five years, all right? 50%. Now, that's 500,000 teachers a year that are gone out of the profession. And we've got to find them from somewhere. And so, you know, this is just the way it goes. Now, I don't know. Theory might be you're bouncing before you're locked in as just a teacher. That is a five-year mark. I just find that to be a little bit curious. I don't know. Maybe they're leaving because the job won't be there in the future. You know, Oxford University just did a study of the top 700 jobs that will be gone, or basically the top 700 jobs and the survivability of these jobs in the next, not 20 years, 17 years. So in the next 17 years, will these jobs be there? Now, to these 700, they ranked them. And they said, what's the survivability rate? All right? Multiple choice on this quiz. All right? Bookkeepers, telemarketers, what is the survivability rate? All right? 2% for a bookkeeper, 1% for a telemarketer. All right? I wouldn't go and want to be in that business right now. All right? Think about it. Market research analysts, this is a popular one, definitely making a lot of money. Well, make it while you can because 38% survivability rate. What do you think the survivability rate is for a teacher? I had a friend recently tell me, you know, a class is going online. You never know. I mean, this, is, this job might not happen. Well, I don't know. Oxford University did a study on it. I don't know this. But here's what they came up with. You know what the survivability rate is for a teacher? 99.5%. 17 years from now, not even 20. So if you're a kindergartner watching this TEDx, <laughs> by the time you graduate high school, this is a great major. All right? If you're 17, 19, 20 years old, by the time you're raising a family, you're going to have a job. So I just still don't understand why you don't want to be a teacher. Well, awesome jobs. Here's another true-false question. If we gave this as a compelling proposition to youth and said, no, you don't have that ladder that I showed you. You actually have these kinds of jobs. Would that possibly make a difference if we perceived our career path and our options in this sector differently? Would that possibly change how many people want to go into education? If we had these skill sets and they were transferable and we could take them, move them into different parts of a sector over our lifetime, 30, 40, 50 years, not just in a classroom, but in classrooms that are the world, like I do today, all sorts of different jobs. But it's these skill sets that matter. Master teacher, we're in a, an information economy. The flow of information is probably the most valuable asset. And knowing that as a master teacher, how could it be more valuable? What could be more valuable? I don't know. And so I'm sorry to do this to you, but we got a little bit of homework, all right? But it's an easy one. This is what we call constructivism, all right? It's a reflection. All right, this is my favorite. I'm not a homework guy. As a teacher, I didn't, I didn't give a lot of homework, but we reflected a lot. So I'm going to ask you to reflect. Number one, is this a compelling proposition, the latter? 
going up the ladder 30 years? Or is the other one a proposition? Think about it. Which one is a better proposition? But more importantly, this is a reflection for the education profession, the colleges of education, including myself. Are we preparing the next generation to enter a radically different K-12 market? Are we preparing the next generation with skills and skill sets that are radically different? At the core is that yellow, that teaching, pedagogy, understanding how to teach, how to work with youth. That's at the core. And you need years in a classroom to get that. Seven years to be precise before you really master it. But beyond that, you need to know as a teacher, partnerships, community involvement, youth development, marketing, public relations. As colleges of education, are we preparing the next generation with these types of skills? That's a question. For the business community, I ask you this to, to reflect on. I, I ask you that next time that a teacher who might want to apply their craft and those great skills in a different setting, because I don't care what company you're in, people are learning. And that's actually just massively growing around corporations, you name it. If a teacher ever applies for a job, I want you to think, does this count as leading a team? Does this count as reaching diverse audiences? Does this count as creative, out-of-the-box thinkers? And if not, why does that not count? And for all of us, I ask you to think about this one quote. And it doesn't come from Maria Montessori or John Dewey. It comes from Lee Iacocca, a great business leader. He said, in a completely rational society, the best of us would be teachers, and the rest of us would have to settle for something else. Are we rational? Is the way we perceive teachers and the education profession today rational? I want you to think about that. See, I don't think we have a shortage crisis. I think we have a perception crisis. And we can solve this. And if we do solve this, I do believe that we can change this. If we solve this, we just might be able to convince the next generation that there's never been a better time to be a teacher. Thank you. <laughs> Class dismissed.